Today, we're going to move forward into some more territory that will absolutely generate questions as you study. For example, had it ever, ever rained before the flood in Noah's day? Why did God prohibit eating meat that had blood in it? Um, why did Noah curse Ham? Um, who was Abraham in the Bible? Why did God punish Pharaoh for Abraham's lie? That's in Genesis 12. It'll be coming up. That and more questions will come up today as we read. I hope that as you read, you won't just brush over the things that make you go, wait, what? I hope you'll write them down and come back. And then that being said, I hope that you will also not get buried in the weeds of wondering all these questions because we are going to unpack all of that as we study through Genesis. And the point of today is to just read. So that being said, are you ready to dive in? Let's get into God's Word. Welcome back. I'm Jennifer Richmond, and this is the Dwelling Richly Bible Study, where we love God, heart, soul, mind, and strength. We are women who enthusiastically and intentionally dwell in the Word and let the Word of Christ dwell in us richly. You can find Bible studies and video teaching like this on my blog and the Dwelling Richly podcast. Subscribe to this channel, hit that little church bell so you can get notified whenever I drop a new video. Let's get into the Word. All right, well, let's do just that and dwell in the Word of God together today. I'm so glad that you're with me. We are in Lesson 1, that's Day 3, and there's... <laughs> If your mind has not already exploded after reading yesterday's passages, Genesis 1 through 6, get ready. Buckle up. We're going to be doing Genesis 7 through 14 today. A uh, lot to cover, but we're just going to breeze right through and read God's Word. Today, for our opening time, as always, we, uh, we're going to write, um, but we're going to begin by just praying together today. And I've given you a prompt this morning to ask you to consider praying about one thing that you can be thankful to God for today. Write that thankfulness there and then take time to pray before you begin the lesson. Let's go ahead and do that together right now. Heavenly Father, right now I am very thankful for you as my sustainer. There's a lot going on in my mind, in my heart, and even in my body today. So thank you for sustaining me. Thank you for uh, the love that you give me that I feel from friends and family. And thank you also just for the way you speak into my spirit. Thank you for our time together in your word and your amazing way that you jog our minds and get us to think more and then satisfy us every morning with your love. We thank you for your great love right now for us in your word in Jesus name. And everyone said, Hallelujah. Amen. That's our closing amen that we say together. If you're not familiar with that, joining us in Bible study. Uh, but amen. Amen. Right. All right. So our memorize and meditate focus, as, as always will be in this particular opening lesson, is to write Isaiah 40, 28 above. Can you say it from memory today? Write this verse on a sticky note. Put it somewhere that you'll see throughout the day. Take a photo of your verse and send it to your study buddy. Send that verse in. Write it down. Engage. The dynamic that's unique, I think, in the way the Dwelling Richly study is structured is the constant encouragement for you to engage, to share on social media. You're already there anyway. Get the Word of God out there. Um, share with your friends. You're already texting a friend. Get the Word of God into her heart and let her engage back with you. And hopefully you have taken me at my word and as I've encouraged you to get a study buddy for this Bible study and you found one. And so send today, send her a, either a handwritten note, a picture of it, an encouragement, an insight, a thought, or just I'm thinking of you. And uh, then put a post-it note up of your Bible verse somewhere uh, in your home, on your mirror, in your car, wherever you want to do that. But engage in God's word and let's not just read and check it off our list. Let's really let the word of Christ dwell in us richly and let us return the favor, dwell richly in the word. And that's part of what we do uh, by memorizing, meditating, uh, praying with thankfulness, being prompted to engage in this community. So thank you for being a part of that. Oh, if you haven't already, hit that subscribe button and leave a comment today. Let me know that you were watching and listening along. All right, number three, read and engage. We're continuing our big overview of Genesis. Did you know that most Christians have never read through a book of the Bible? Maybe a few passages, perhaps heard a sermon series, but you are doing something really amazing. Remember, your word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. That means every word of God. Let the light of God's word shine on your path today. All right. 
Let's go ahead and dig in. We're going to read. We're going to be focusing on the who and the where, the action or attribute that we see of God and um, questions and thoughts that you have that, and also ways that it ties into our ongoing theme throughout the study of Genesis of Lost and Found. Um, before we get to that, I do want to give a shout out today for um, just people who've been engaging with me, sending emails, asking great questions. And at the end of Bible study, our closing Bible study of, um, of last week, uh, Michelle asked a fabulous question during our Q&A session. And so I want to give a shout out to Michelle and I want to ask that question out loud to everybody here listening right now. Her question was along these lines. I had, I had set up throughout the Bible study introduction, please don't use study notes in your Bible. Please don't use commentaries. Uh, I, my rule of thumb, as you know, and this will be review for many of you, is if you're, go if you're going to use a commentary, don't use one use five because you're going to get five different perspectives and you will be able to weigh things out with the help of the Holy Spirit. Um, it short circuits your learning process if when you're reading you just jump down when you get confused and just read the commentary there. Fabulous notes, learned scholars, well lettered and studied men and women who have done the hard work going before us of understanding scripture and bringing it to light. However, you have to know that the commentary, even in your study guide there, or study notes in your Bible, as good as it could be, is just some person's thought about things and will reveal their particular bent on how they perceive um, a passage. And so if we get really locked into that, it can present a problem because then we're steadfast on, well, I believe this and, you know, fill in the blank on this. Why do you believe that though? Have you done the work? Have you done the study? Have you really done your own personal thinking? So I don't, I don't want you to short circuit your thinking process. That being said, Michelle asked a very good question, tying in to another point that I made to not take the Bible out of its cultural background context. It's an ancient civilization. It's an Eastern culture. And we are American Western 21st century women basically coming from a, a strongly Greek influenced culture. And so we need to understand the Eastern mindset and the ancient civilizations in which the, the work, the content of Genesis was originally written and who it was originally written to. So uh, in that context, she asked the question and said, um, well, if we can't use study notes or commentary, how are we supposed to understand the ancient cultural context? Something along those lines. Great question, Michelle. Really important one. And so here's what I recommend. Get the cultural backgrounds Bible or just even their study notes and use that because cultural background is definitely different than um, a study Bible that's just telling you what that particular author thinks this passage means. Um, it's giving you a context at least. And a great resource is called the Cultural Backgrounds Bible. It's available in the NIV for sure, which I have. I believe it's also available in the New King James and a couple other translations, just the study notes on that. But I'm going, I have a list on YouTube, I mean YouTube, on um, my Amazon page that's open to the public. It's the Dwelling Witchley Bible Study uh, resource list. Just go there, use that to kind of shop from and uh and and get some references and some resource guides from that so absolutely understand the cultural context of things thank you michelle for that really really good question all right let's go ahead and get into genesis chapter seven and i'm just going to read straight through you jot down your notes join me in study i might pause and make a couple comments here or there but my goal really is to just move us through all right here we go genesis chapter seven through fourteen the Lord said to Noah, Come into the ark, you and all your household, for I consider you godly among this generation. You must take with you seven pairs of every kind of clean animal, the male and its mate, two of every kind of unclean animal, the male and its mate, and also seven pairs of every kind of bird in the sky, male and female, to preserve their offspring on the face of the entire earth. For in seven days I will cause it to rain on the earth for forty days and forty nights, and I will wipe from the face of the ground every living thing that I have made. And Noah did all that the Lord commanded him. Noah was six hundred years old when the flood waters engulfed the earth. 
Noah entered the ark along with his sons, his wife, and his sons' wives because of the flood waters. Pairs of clean animals, of unclean animals, of birds, and of everything that creeps along the ground, male and female, came into the ark, uh, came into yeah, came into the ark to Noah, just as God had commanded him. And after seven days, the flood waters engulfed the earth. In the 600th year of Noah's life, in the se second month, on the 17th day of the month, on that day, all the fountains of the great deep burst open and the floodgates of the heavens were opened. Rain fell on the earth 40 days and 40 nights. On that very day, Noah entered the ark, accompanied by his sons Shem, Ham, and Japheth, along with his wife and his sons, three wives. They entered along with every living creature after its kind, every animal after its kind, every creeping thing that creeps on the earth after its kind, and every bird after its kind, everything with wings. Pairs of all creatures that have breath of life came into the ark to Noah. Those that entered were male and female, just as God commanded him. Then the Lord shut him in. The flood engulfed the earth for 40 days as waters increased. They lifted the ark and raised it above the earth. The waters completely overwhelmed the earth and the ark floated on the surface of the waters. The waters completely inundated the earth so that even all the high mountains under the entire sky were covered. The waters rose more than two uh, tw uh, 20 feet above the mountains and all living things that moved on the earth died including the birds domestic animals wild animals all the creatures that swarm over the earth and all humankind everything on dry land that had the breath of life in its nostrils died so the lord destroyed every living thing that was on the surface of the ground including people animals creatures that creep along the ground and birds of the sky they were wiped off the earth only Noah and those who were with him in the ark survived. The waters prevailed over the earth for 150 days. It's a lot to take in, obviously. Uh, Noah, key person in the who and the where. And uh, I'm going to leave it to you to jot down your you know, specific thoughts about the where, because that's an important concept in this particular chapter. And uh, also anything you would like to note about the nature of God and his actions in this passage as well and one of the things also that a commenter brought up uh, earlier this week on lesson one day one I believe Cariella thank you uh, was what's the difference between the nature and the character of God so go back to lesson one day one if you're curious about that and look at my response to Cariella on that great question and I really appreciate the engagement if you have any questions and you're wondering or just scratching your head about things please leave a comment here as you're watching or listening and uh, I can engage with you that way. Also, those other people who are listening in and, and engaging can do that as well. It's all part of letting the word of Christ dwell in us richly and hello, Dela, and us doing the same thing as well. All right, chapter eight. But God remembered Noah and all the wild animals and domestic animals that were with him in the ark. God caused a wind to blow over the earth and the waters receded. The fountains of the deep and the floodgates of heaven were closed and the rain stopped falling from the sky. The waters kept receding steadily from the earth so that they had gone down by the end of the 150 days. On the 17th day of the seventh month, the ark came to rest on one of the mountains of Ararat. The waters kept on receding until the 10th month. On the first day of the 10th month, the tops of the mountains became visible. At the end of the 40 days, Noah opened the window he had made in the ark and sent out a raven. It kept flying back and forth until the waters had dried up on the earth. Then Noah sent out a dove to see if the waters had receded <laughs> from the surface of the ground. The dove could not be uh, could not find a resting place for its feet because water still covered the surface of the entire deep. <laughs> Here's, I'm going to turn the camera so you guys can see Dale a little better. She's so, she's so cute. <laughs> You're funny. <laughs> Growling and, and, and hovering about the surface of the deep. <laughs> Okay, here we go. We'll continue. I don't even know where I left off. That was so funny. Uh, the dove could not find a resting place for its feet because the water still covered the surface of the earth. And so it returned to Noah in the ark. He stretched out his hand, took the dove, and brought it back into the ark. He waited seven more days and then sent out the dove again from the ark. When the dove returned to him in the evening, 
uh, there was a freshly plucked olive leaf in its beak. No one knew that the waters had receded from the earth. Isn't that, oh, you're gonna chew my glasses. I don't think so. Chew my glasses. <laughs> you can't see her now. I know, this is a total distraction. <laughs> there she is, Dela. <laughs> All right, I'll try to, I'll try to stay focused. But you're very distracted. You're, uh, I feel for you mamas who are doing Bible study with toddlers. She's like having a toddler, my Dela is. No one can see you if you sit there. You should sit back in the corner where they can see you better. <laughs> Here we go. Uh, plucked an olive leaf in its beak. No one knew that the waters had receded from the earth. He waited another seven days, sent the dove out again, but it did not return to him this time. In Noah's 601st year, on the first day of the first month, <clears throat> waters... The waters had dried up from the earth and Noah removed the covering from the ark and saw that the surface of the ground was dry. And by the 27th day of the second month, the earth was dry. Then God spoke to Noah and said, come out of the ark, you and your wife, your sons, your sons' wives with you. Bring out with you all the living creatures that are with you. Bring out every living thing, including the birds, animals, and every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. Let them increase and be fruitful and multiply on the earth. Noah went out with his sons, his wife, his sons' wives, every living creature, every creeping thing, every bird, everything that moves on the earth went out of the ark into their groups. Uh, in their groups, Noah built an altar to the Lord. Then he took some of every kind of clean animal, clean bird, offered burnt offerings on the altar. The Lord smelled the soothing aroma and said to himself, I will never again curse the ground because of humankind. Even though the inclination of their minds is evil from childhood on, I will never again destroy everything that lives as I have just done. While the earth continued to exist, planting, while the earth continues to exist, planting time and harvest, cold and heat, summer and winter, and day and night will not cease. Powerful stuff, right? Great covenant from God, great promise. Let's continue on in chapter nine. Okay, Dela? <laughs> chapter nine. Then God blessed Noah and his sons and said to them, be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth. Every living creature of the earth and every bird of the sky will be terrified of you. Everything that creeps on the ground and all the fish of the sea are under your authority. You may eat any moving thing that lives as I gave you the green plants. I now give you everything. That should make you connect back to God's original command in Eden. That's a great connection point there. I now give you everything, but you must not eat meat with its life that is its blood in it. Hmm. For your lifeblood, I will surely exact punishment from every living creature. I will exact punishment from each person. I will exact punishment for the life of the individual since the man was his relative. Whoever sheds human blood by other humans must his blood be shed. For in God's image, God has made humankind. Underline, highlight, circle, scratch and sniff, sticker, arrows, big, huge, very important key concept here. Write this down. Make sure this is in your notes. Ask the questions. Think about it. We're going to dig deeply into this when we get to this passage in a couple of weeks. But as for you, be fruitful and multiply. Be increase abundantly on the earth and multiply on it. God said to Noah and his sons, look, I now confirm my covenant with you and your descendants after you and with every living creature that is with you, including the birds, the domestic animals, and every living creature of the earth with you. And those, all those that came out of the ark with you, every living creature on the earth, I confirm my covenant, underline, highlight, circle, scratch and stuff, stickers, arrows, my covenant with you never again, all living things will be wiped out by the waters of a flood. Never again will a flood destroy the earth. And God said, this is the guarantee of the covenant I am making with you and every living creature with you, a covenant for all subs subsequent generations. I will place my rainbow in the clouds and it will become a guarantee of the covenant between me and the earth. Whenever I bring clouds over the earth and the rainbow appears in the clouds, then I will remember my covenant with you and with all living creatures of all kinds. Never again will the waters become a flood and destroy all living things. When the rainbow is in the clouds, I will notice it and remember the perpetual covenant between God and all living creatures of all kinds that are on the earth. So God said to Noah, 
This is the guarantee of the covenant that I am confirming between me and all living things that are on the earth. The sons of Noah who came out of the ark were Shem, Ham, and Japheth. Now Ham was the father of Canaan. These were the three sons of Noah, and from the whole earth was populated. Noah, a man after this, of the soil, began to plant a vineyard. When he drank some of the wine, he got drunk and uncovered himself inside his tent. Ham, the father of Canaan, saw his father's nakedness and told his two brothers who were outside. Shem and Japheth took the garment and placed it on their shoulders. Then they walked in backward and covered up their father's nakedness. Their faith faces were turned the other way so they did not see their father's nakedness. When God awoke from his drunken when God when Noah awoke from his drunken stupor, he learned what his youngest son had done to him. So he said, Cursed be Canaan, the lowest of slaves, he will be to his brothers. He also said, Worthy of praise is the Lord, notice the all caps of Lord, the God of Shem. May Canaan be the slave of Shem. May God enlarge Japheth's territory and numbers. May he live in the tents of Shem. And may Canaan be the slave of Japheth. After the flood, Noah lived 350 years. The entire lifetime of Noah was 950 years. And then he died. <laughs> right? Right? Okay, here we go. Number, uh, chapter 10. This is the account of Noah's sons, Shem, Ham, and Japheth, sons born um, sons were born to them after the flood. This is the account of Noah's sons, Shem, Ham, and Japheth. Sons were born to them after the flood. The sons of Japheth were Gomer, Magog, Madai, Javan, Tubal, Meshech, and Tiras. The sons of Gomer were Ashkenaz, Riphath, Riphath and to <laughs> Togarma. Now, just to pause right here. Number one, this is challenging to read and try to pronounce these names. It's challenging to read as a teacher. I remember when kids would come to the classroom on the first day of school and I would just try to pronounce just regular, you know, American English names and still struggle with pronouncing names. So pardon me as I stumble through these. And number two, this, these are Hebrew names from ancient Hebrew and nobody actually knows the correct true pronunciation of these ancient names. So do your best, enjoy, and if you've heard it differently or if you have a better way of pronouncing it, please feel free to let me know. Um, but uh, this is the best of my ability to get through these names and we're going to be doing a lot of those through Genesis. I might as well just remind you about that right now. Okay, here we go. The sons of Jabin were... Elisha, Tarshish, the Kitim, the, Kiti, <laughs> the Kitim, and the Do, Dodanim. Man, I should have practiced all these names before <laughs> reading it. I just should have read it out loud to myself to make sure I can get through it. Here we go. From these, the coastlands of the nations were separated into their lands, everyone according to its language, according to their families by their nations. The sons of Ham were Cush, Mizraim, Mizraim Put and Canaan. The sons of Cush were uh, Seba, Havila, Sabta, Rama, and Sabteka. The sons of Rama were Sheba and Dedan. Cush was the father of Nimrod. He began to be a valiant warrior on the earth. He was a mighty hunter before the Lord. That is why it is said, like Nimrod, the mighty hunter before the Lord, the primary regions of his kingdom were Babel, uh, Babel, um, Erech, Akkad, and um, Kalneh in the land of Shinar. From that land, he went to Assyria, where he built Nineveh, Rehoboth, Ir, Kala, and Resen, which is between Nineveh and the great city of Kala. Mizraim was the father of the Ludites, Anamites, Lehabites, Naphtuhites, uh, Pathrusites, Kasluhites, from whose, whom the Philistines came, and Kaphirites. Canaan was the father of Sidon, his firstborn Heth, the Jebusites, Amorites, Girgashites, Hivites, Archites, Sinites, Avrodites, Zemorites, and Hamathites. Eventually, the families of the Canaanites were scattered, and the borders of Canaan extended from Sidon all the way to Gerar as far as Gaza, all the way to Sodom, Gomorrah, Adma, and Zeboim, as far as Lasha. These are the sons of Ham, according to their families, according to their languages, by their lands, and by their nations. And sons were also born to Shem, the older brother of Japheth, the father of all the sons of Eber. The sons of Shem were Elam, Ashur, Arphaxad, Lud, Aram. The sons of Aram were Uz, Hol, Gether, Mash. Arphaxad was the father of Shelah. Shelah was the father of Eber. Two sons were born to Eber. One was named Peleg because in his days the earth was divided and his brother's name was Joktan. Joktan was the father of Almodad. 
uh, Shelaf, um, Hazar Mavet, Hazar Mavet, <laughs> Jera, Hadoram, Uzel, Digla, Obal, Abima, Abimael, Sheba, Ophir, Havila, and Joab. These are all the sons of Jaktan. Their dwelling place was from Misha all the way to Sephar in the eastern hills. These are the sons of Shem, according to their families, according to their languages, by their lands, and according to their nations. These are the families of the sons of Noah, according to their generations, by their nations, and from these nations spread over all the earth after the flood. Chapter 11. The whole earth had a common language and a common vocabulary. Please understand that line in context with what you just read in chapter 10 and you should trigger a potential wait what there should be a wait what question coming into your mind right now whole earth had a common language and common vocabulary think about that in context of what you literally just read in chapter 9 go back if you're not like i said in the message uh from lesson one or our introduction message when you read through Genesis in particular, if you're finding yourself bored, confused, angry, annoyed, or horrified, um, if you're not one of those things at any given moment, you're not paying attention. You're just letting it go by quickly. Please be careful. Don't do that, especially with this chapter. Here we go. The whole earth had a common language and a common vocabulary. When the people moved eastward, they found a plain in Shinar and settled there. Then they said to one another, come, let's make bricks and bake them thoroughly. They had brick instead of stone and tar instead of mortar. Then they said, come, let's build ourselves a city and a tower with its top in the heavens so that we may make a name for ourselves. Otherwise, we will be scattered across the face of the entire earth. But the Lord came down to see the city and the tower that the people had started building. And the Lord said, if as one people all sharing a common language, they have begun to do this, then nothing they plan to do will be beyond them. Come, let's go down and confuse their language so they won't be able to understand each other. So the Lord scattered them from there, from, from there across the face of the entire earth, and they stopped building the city. That is why its name was called Babel. Because there the Lord confused the language of the entire world. And from there the Lord scattered them across the face of the entire earth. Verse 10. The genealogy of Shem. This is the account. Or here's a Hebrew word that you can write down today. Extra bonus just for those guys listening in on the podcast today. Toledot. This is the Toledot of Shem. Shem was 100 years old when he became the father of Arphaxad two years after the flood. And after becoming the father of Arphaxad, Shem lived 500 years and had other sons and daughters. When Arphaxad had lived 35 years, he became the father of Shelah. And after he became the father of Shelah, Arphaxad lived 403 years and had other sons and daughters. When Shelah had lived 30 years, he became the father of Eber. And after he became the father of Eber, Shelah lived 403 years and had other sons and daughters. When Eber had lived 34 years, he became the father of Peleg. And after he became the father of Peleg, Eber lived 430 years and had other sons and daughters. When Peleg had lived 30 years, he became the father of Reu. And after he became the father of Reu, Peleg lived 209 years and had other sons and daughters. When Reu had lived 32 years, he became the father of Serug. And after he became the father of Serug, Reu lived 207 years and had other sons and daughters. When Serug lived 30 years, he became the father of Nahor. And after he became the father of Nahor, Serug lived 200 years and had other sons and daughters. When Nahor had lived 29 years, he became the father of Terah. And after he became the father of Terah, Nahor lived 119 years and had other sons and daughters. When Terah had lived 70 years, he became the father of Avram, Nahor, and Haran. Really familiar name, hopefully, right now, right? <laughs> Write that down. Ta-da! If it's not familiar to you, that's okay. Here we go. Verse 27. The Toledot, or the account of Terah. Terah became the father of Abram, Nahor, and Haran. And Haran became the father of Lot. Haran died in the land of his birth in Ur of the Chaldeans, where his father Terah was still alive. And Abram and Nahor took wives for themselves. The name of Abram's wife was Sarai. The name of Nahor's wife was Milcah. She was the daughter of Haran, who was the father of both Milcah and Iscah. But Sarai was barren. She had no children. Terah took his son Abram, his grandson Lot, the son of Haran, and his daughter-in-law Sarai, his son Abram's wife. 
and with them he set out from Ur of the Chaldeans to go to Canaan. When they came to Haran, they settled there. The lifetime of Terah was 205 years, and he died in Haran. All right, chapter 12. It's getting good. We're zooming in. You feeling it? You big, big, big story. And zoom, 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 zoom. And now really zooming in. Now the Lord said to Abram, Go out from your country, your relatives, and your father's household to the land that I will show you, that I will make you into a great nation. I will bless you, and I will make your name great, so that you will be, you will exemplify divine blessing. I will bless those who bless you, but the one who treats you lightly, I must curse, so that all the families of the earth may receive blessing through you. All right, I would be surprised, here's Dela again, I would be surprised if you don't have this already marked because this has come up for sure in the last several studies. I know it came up in Romans last year's study, and I know it came up in Acts, and I I know it came up in the previous studies uh, as well. So hang on to this passage if you haven't already highlighted it. Um, you know, we've highlighted it multiple times in previous studies. So Abram left just as Dela just did. <laughs> so Abram left just as the Lord had told him to do. And Lot went with him. Now Abram was 75 years old when he departed from Haran. And Abram took his wife Sarai, his nephew Lot, and all the possessions they had accumulated and the people that uh, they had acquired from Haran. And they left for the land of Canaan. They entered the land of Canaan. Abram traveled through the land as far as the oak tree of Morah at Shechem. At that time, the Canaanites were in the land. Remember, Canaanites from previous chapter. Make sure you circle that and make those connections. The Lord appeared, all capital Lord, to Abram and said, to your descendants, I will give this land. So Abram built, and now here we go again, the names and Abram and, and Abram. I'm going to go back and forth. It just, I, I hear them differently and see them differently whenever I'm reading. So here we go. The Lord appeared to Abram and said to your descendants, I will give you this land. So Abram built an altar there to the Lord who had appeared to him. Then he moved from there to the hill country east of Bethel, pitched his tent with Bethel on the west, Ai in the east. There he built an altar to the Lord and worshipped the Lord. Abram continually journeyed by stages down to the Negev. There was a famine in the land, so Abram went down to Egypt to stay for a while because the famine was severe. As he approached Egypt, he said to his wife Sarai, look, I know that you are a beautiful woman. When the Egyptians see you, they will say, this is his wife. And they will kill me, but will keep you alive. So tell them you're my sister, so that you may go well for me, because of you, and my life will be spared on account of you. When Abram entered Egypt, the Egyptians saw that the woman was very beautiful. When Pharaoh's officials saw her, they praised her to Pharaoh. So Abram's wife was taken into the household of Pharaoh. And he did treat Abram well on account of her. Abram received sheep and cattle, male donkeys, male servants, female servants, female donkeys, and camels. But the Lord struck Pharaoh and his household with severe diseases because of Sarai, Abram's wife. So Pharaoh summoned Abram and said, What is this you have done to me? Why didn't you tell me that she was your wife? Why did you say she is my sister so that I took her to be my wife? Now, here is your wife. Take her and go. Pharaoh gave his men orders about Abram, and they, so they expelled him along with his wife and all his possessions. Abram went up from Egypt into the Negev. He took his wife, all his possessions with him, as well as Lot. Now, Abram was very wealthy in livestock, silver, and gold, and he journeyed from place to place from the Negev as far as Bethel. He returned to the place where he had pitched his tent in the beginning between Bethel and Ai. This was the place where the uh, where he first built the altar, and there Abram worshipped the Lord. Now Lot, who was traveling with Abram, also had flocks, herds, and tents, but the land could not support them while they were living side by side. Because their possessions were so great, they were not able to live alongside one another. So there were quarrels between Abram's herdsmen and Lot's herdsmen. Now the Canaanites and the Perizzites were living in the land at that time. Abram, Abram said to Lot, there, let there be no quarreling between me and you and between my herdsmen and your herdsmen, for we are close relatives. Is not the whole land before you? Separate yourselves now from me. If you go to the left, I shall go to the right. If you go to the right, I shall go to the left. Lot looked up, saw the whole region of the Jordan. He noticed that all of it was well watered. This was before the Lord obliterated Sodom and Gomorrah. Oh, minor detail there. Lot uh, liked the garden of the Lord, uh, like the land of Egypt, all the way to Zoar. Lot chose for himself the whole region of the Jordan and traveled toward the east. So the relatives separated from each other. Abram settled in the land of, the, of Canaan, but Lot settled among the cities of the Jordan plain and pitched his tents next to Sodom. Now the people of Sodom were extremely wicked, rebels against the Lord. After Lot had departed, the Lord said to Abram, 
Look from the place where you stand to the north, south, east, and west. I will give you all the land that you see to you and your descendants forever. And I will make your descendants like the dust of the earth, so that if anyone is able to count the dust of the earth, then your descendants shall also be counted. Get up, walk throughout the land, for I will give it to you. So Abram moved his tents and went to live by the oaks of Mamre in Hebron, and he built an altar to the Lord there. All right, chapter 14, wrapping it up. At that time, Amraphel, king of Shinar, Ariok, king of Elisar, uh, Ker, uh, Kedo Lomar, Lomar, king of Elam, and Tidal, king of the na of nations, went to war against Bera, king of Sodom, Bersha, king of Gomorrah, Shinab, king of Adma, Shember, uh, king of Zeboim, and the king of Bela, that is Zoar. These last five kings joined forces in the valley of Sedim, that is the Salt Sea. For 12 years they had served Kedo Lamar, but in the 30th, 13th year they rebelled. In the 14th year, Kedo Lamar and the kings who were his allies came and defeated the Raphaites in Asheroth, uh, uh, Karnaim, uh, the Zuites in Ham, the Emites in Shaveh Kiriathim, and the Horites in their hill country of Seir, as far as El Paran, which is near the desert. Then they attacked En Mishpat, that is Kadesh, again, and they conquered all the territory of the Amalekites, as well as the Amorites who were living in Hezazan Tamar. The king of Sodom, the king of Gomorrah, the king of Adma, the king of Zeboim, and the king of Bela, that is Zor, went out and prepared for battle in the valley of Saddam. They met um, Kido Lamar, king of Elam, Tidal, king of nations, um, Armaphel, king of Shinar, and Ariok, king of Elisar. Four kings fought against five. Now, the valley of Sedim was full of tar pits. When the king of Sodom, um, Sodom and Gomorrah fled, they fell into them, but some survivors fled into the hills. The four victorious kings took all the possessions and food of Sodom and Gomorrah and left. They also took Abram's nephew Lot and his possessions when they left, for Lot was living in Sodom. A fugitive came and told Abram the Hebrew. Now, Abram, Abram was living in the Oaks of Mamre, the Amorite, the brother of Eshkol and Aner. These were allied by treaty with Abram. When Abram heard that his nephew had been taken captive, he mobilized his 13, <laughs> 318 trained men who had been born in his household, and he pursued the invaders as far as Dan. Then, during the night, Abram divided his forces against them and defeated them. He chased them as far as Hobah, which is north of Damascus. He retreated all the stolen property. He also brought back his nephew Lot and his possessions, as well as the women and the rest of the people. After Abram returned from defeating Kedul Lamar and the kings who were with him, the king of Sodom went out to meet Abram in the valley of Shaveh, known as the King's Valley. Melchizedek, king of Salem, underlined that name, king of Salem, brought out bread and wine. Now, he was the priest of the Most High God. He blessed Abram, saying, Blessed be Abram by the Most High God, creator of heaven and earth, worthy of praise is the Most High God, who delivered your enemies into your hand. Abram gave Melchizedek a tenth of everything. Then the king of Sodom said to Abram, Give me the t people and take the, the possession for yourself. But Abram replied to the king of Sodom, I raise my hand to the Lord, the Most High God, creator of heaven and earth, and vow that I will take nothing belonging to you, not even a, a thread or a strap of a sandal. That way you can never say, it is I who made Abram rich. I will take nothing except compensation for what the young men have eaten. As for the share of the men who went before, went with me, Aner, Eshkol, Mamre, let them take their share. Oh my gosh! <laughs> All right. Do you remember when we studied through Hebrews, Dwelling Richly Women? And we talked at length about Melchizedek. Well, here he is. We're going to get digging in and talk about him in this lesson as well. All right. God bless you guys. I'm so glad that you were with me today. I really look forward to being here uh, in our next passage. We're going to be continuing the story, reading along. You guys are awesome for reading through. This is a big deal. It's not easy to do. I'm really proud of you. And it's going to pay off. Your faithfulness is absolutely going to pay off. So welcome back tomorrow ahead of time. And uh, let's uh, look forward with great anticipation getting into God's Word together. Know, as always, you are loved and prayed for. And I look forward to being back here again with you real soon so we can dwell again in the Word.